Well, hello. Welcome to an adventure. Uh, how is everybody today? Hang on, I'm going to fix the camera because it is. <laughs> I hope you're having a good day. Um, apparently, the uh, <laughs> the tool that says what song is playing is currently broken, it looks like. So I'm just going to go and turn that off. I do not know why it is broken, but I will have to investigate that later. Uh, so, um, yeah. But hi, everybody. Uh, I hope that you're having a good Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> let me see who's here. I see uh, Lord Portico. Hello. Um, yes, the, the the medical command will probably come in handy today. Um uh, hi, Hannah. And Matt M33. Hello, hello. Uh, and I see a three stream streak from Hannah. There's already streaking through the archives. Yes. Um, so, yeah, cool. I don't know. So, I, I've switched on so that it will tell what the song is in chat. That becomes distracting. Just tell me to turn it off and I will do so. Um, but yeah, hi. Uh, <laughs> I am um, Rogan27, aka Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I am the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is um, Archival Adventures, which I do once a week, sharing materials from special collections and university archives here. Um, yeah, since we're looking at uh, historical documents, it's important to pay attention to the history of the institution that actually owns them. So we like to start by just taking a glance um, <clears throat> at a little bit of uh, the history that we should not forget. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that the Morrill Land Grant College Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands in California and other areas in the West. Virginia Tech acknowledges that its Blacksburg campus sits partly on land that was previously the site of the Smithfield and Solitude Plantation. Uh, plantations owned by members of the Preston family. Between the 1770s and the 1860s, the Prestons and other local white families that owned parcels of what became Virginia Tech also un owned hundreds of enslaved people. Uh, enslaved Black people generated resources that financed Virginia Tech's predecessor institution, the Preston and Olin Institute, and they also worked on the construction of its building. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, we just like to make sure that we remember. So, today, that um, that medical command probably going to come in handy. Hi, Fluid Ann. Um, and the reason for that is uh, we're going to be taking a look at the Mead and Baker Apothecary Ledger. Um, I say V, but it is a Mead and Baker Apothecary Ledger. There are likely others, uh, but we have one here. Um, so, what does that mean? <laughs> um, let's see, we have one ledger in one box. Uh... Biographical note. Ah, okay. <clears throat> so uh, we get a biographical note for both Baker and Mead, and then a historical note for Mead and Baker, the company, as well as a description of what this collection is in itself. So. Thomas Roberts Baker, son of Hillary and Margaret Marshall Roberts Baker, uh, was born in Richmond, Virginia, May 30th, 1825. Uh, he learned the pharmaceutical business under Alexander Duval. 
which seems a familiar name, then attended Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, graduating in 1852. Uh, during the American Civil War, he enlisted in the Confederate Army as a member of the Richmond Howitzers, but was ordered to report to the Army's medical department, where he would serve throughout the war. Uh, he married Maria Bergwin in 1868, and they had one son. Richard Hardaway Mead, the son of Benjamin and Eliza Hardaway Mead, uh, was born in Powhatan County in Virginia in January of 1831. And then they moved to Richmond, which isn't that far from Powhatan County. Um, he found early employment in the drugstore of Alexander Duval. In 1856, Mead and Baker partnered to establish an apothecary shop on the corner of Richmond's 9th and Franklin Streets. During the Civil War, Mead served as a member of the House Guard. I don't know what the House Guard is. Does anybody know what the House Guard is? Uh, he married Jane Catherine Fontaine. The Meads would have five children. Though Mead was the junior partner of Mead and Baker, he is credited with having played a larger role in creating many of the company's formulas, including that for a mouthwash that would become very popular. Let's see. Uh, Mead and Baker eventually moved to the 900 block of East Main Street and became the largest apothecaries in the city. When Mead died in 1880, Baker bought out his partner's interest in the company. Their mouthwash product eventually became so successful that Baker in 1888 created the separate Mead and Baker Carbolic Mouthwash Company, which manufactured and sold not only its namesake product, but a tooth powder as well. Uh, at the same time, the original drugstore was sold to the head pharmacist, William P. Poitras. In 1892, the mouthwash company became a stock company with Baker serving as president, so it went public. Uh, Thomas Roberts Baker died in 1906. All right. So in the box that we have, there is a single accounts ledger. It has more than 600 pages, so we're definitely not going to look at every single page. Uh, the ledger appears to be a day book recording customer names and addresses, dates of purchases, itemized lists of purchases and payments. The store's sales consisted almost entirely of pharmaceuticals and related health and beauty goods, but the ledger also records sales for such household items as spices, chewing tobacco, stamps, and pencils. Uh, many of the account entries made during the 1860s illustrate rampant inflation within the Confederacy. <clears throat> the price recorded for a toothbrush in February 1861, for example, is 25 cents, while a January 1865 entry records the price for that same article as $12. Though the ledger contains account information only for customers outside of Richmond, including a number of customers in other states, suggests that the volume may have been used to record only mail order purchases. This theory is supported by the fact that the single, single ledger enumerates an entire decade's worth of sales, far too few for a company that has been described as one of the largest drugstores in 19th century Richmond. So, uh, could it be Home Guard and not House Guard? I would, I would suspect not because I know who wrote this finding aid and I don't think he would have made that mistake. Um, the only thing you're finding is for Home Guard. Home Guard of the several states of the Confederacy during the American Civil War included all able-bodied white males between the ages of 18 and 50 who were exempt from Confederate service. Uh, accepting only the governor and other officials. The Home Guard replaced the militia whose members had volunteered or been conscripted into service. Hmm. I, yeah, I'm, I, I'm guessing that maybe maybe the terminology was interchangeable. Uh, I would, that would be something to investigate, possibly. <laughs> Home Guard peacekeepers during Civil War. North Carolina. Yeah. I don't know. Um, 
American Civil War. Uh, da -da -da. Hmm. I may have found there's definitely a lot of mentions of home guard you're you're not wrong there but I there's one I see the words house guard let me see <laughs> to the protection offered by his house guard approved of the socializing which took place between the soldiers. Huh. It's talking about the occupation of Chapel Hill. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. When I just put in House Guard, it comes up with White House Guard, which um, that would not apply to the Confederate States. Old Spring House Guard? Yeah, not sure. Um, so it's entirely possible that the source that, uh, that John used to write the note in the Finding Aid uh, used the terminology house guard, and so that's what he typed in there. But, uh, yeah, I'm not finding anything really more than what you were finding about the Confederate home guard. So... <clears throat> hmm. We will move on to actually look at the book itself. Um... I have oops, left it in the box. So right now, uh, all you're getting is a close-up of the box. Uh, but let me raise up this camera a little. And we can... You'll get to see how we're actually storing this one. Um, this item, <clears throat> I do not know its worth, like value, like monetary value, but uh, it has been cataloged as part of um, the belongings of Virginia Tech Foundation, which generally only happens if either a certain fund was used to purchase it or if it was one of the more expensive items. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, but I could dig into it. I also don't really see that I need to, but uh, that's just like a clue of like, hmm. Uh, so, inside the box, tissue paper, and foam. So foam to frame it, as well as a piece on top so that it sort of will stay in place and won't shift around too much. Uh, congratulations, Fluidan, on being randomly selected as a VIP for the stream. Enjoy your digital gemstone <laughs> that will appear next to your name uh, for this stream. Such a great prize. It isn't a bad prize. It just means you get some acknowledgement for having attended and chatted in the chat. Um, so yeah. This item um, uh, there was a note in the Finding Aid noting that prior to processing, prior to it being described, 
it had been sent to a professional conservator for full treatment. So um, it had uh, a professional conservator work on it. Um, and so we'll probably see, I mean, it's basically, it's got a lovely binding. That's one thing you can see. Um, I love that my camera, I, I tried with the green screen today. I don't know what's up with the freaking chroma key. <laughs> I don't know what happened either, because it was doing really good, and then now it's messy. I do not know. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Not sure what changed. Anywho, uh, so it's got a lovely. Basically, I I suspect that this is probably a completely new uh, cover slash binding. Um, but I don't know for certain. Uh, inside the ledger, we start uh, with information on where they got the ledger, apparently. Uh, 1892, J.W. Randolph and Company, booksellers and stationers uh, in Richmond. And of course, whenever somebody purchased something like this, <clears throat> the, the company would tend to have a book plate in it like this, as well as um, quite often we find the, the year's calendar. I don't know. A lot of them have that. I'm not sure why. Um, let's see. Okay, so here's where we can see some of the work of the conservator. Um, and I kind of wanted to point to that a little bit as we get started here. Um... So it has the lovely cover, but then also the pages. You can see here this page. Um, it, it, you can see like where this brown edge is here, where this line is. That's actually the crumbling edge of the original page. And there is a cotton paper or like a, a fiber cloth type uh, paper that's been used to support the page and um, complete a new edge for it so that it won't uh, continue crumbling and deteriorating. Um, from, like, I can't, just looking at it, it's really difficult to tell exactly where that new material starts and the old material ends. So if I go and take the macro camera in, like this part here is definitely original paper. And this part here is definitely what's been used to repair. The transition between the two is not super obvious. Like the the extra, like the repair material, um, just sort of overlaps just a tiny bit, uh, and you can see a little bit of like here. You can see uh, the texture of the new material. And when the texture ends, you're back into the original page. So it's not even like a straight edge uh, where that new material has been added. Um, it's really quite interesting how they how they do that. So I figured that would be an interesting tidbit to see in looking at the uh, the ledger. Um, but, of course, the ledger also has writing in it. 
There's contents. Somebody used the ledger. What? There's informational content. Um. All right. Now we see if I can in any way read their writing. Like this, this clearly says need, but so does that. At least it looks that way. Um, neither one of those looks like Baker. <laughs> yeah, I'm not certain what. It's like they started and then stopped and then started. And then, anyway, we get Mead and Baker here. Uh, question is what? That says Virginia. I have very little idea what what the other words right there are. Oh, so that says Richmond. <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. Uh I'm unclear, though, as to what this says. So it's got... Yeah, not sure. That could be a capital I but then I can't really make out what the letters inside of it are. There is no helpful um, transcription, so. And then we got Messrs, Mead and Baker. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why they've written on this page like so many times. Messers, Mead and Baker. Messers, Mead and Baker. Like, over and over and over again. I'm uncertain why the first page is just their names over and over again. And then at the bottom, uh, their initials. R.H. Mead, T.R. Baker. I don't know. But, yeah. I'm actually going to... It's bothering me, so I'm going to turn off the, um, announce what's playing in chat. Uh, well, let's see what some of their sales looked like. Or as far as, like, what did people actually order? Or, you know, what other informational content is in here? Uh, Richmond, September 4th, 18... Something. Um, I presume it's 1861, just based on the binding aid and what was written there. Um, Dr. John Kramer? Possibly? I'm uncertain. Anyway, uh, in Halifax, uh, 
Pennsylvania. South Boston Depot. Let's see what was purchased. R A D I and then it says Serpentaria. I this one I am unfamiliar with. If anybody happens to know, uh, please share, but I can also do a search. Um, <clears throat> Something the task bought. That's definitely potassium. C H L. I wonder if it's chlorine, potassium, but then I don't know what this would be. There's definitely some abbreviations happening. Uh, sulfur or sulfuric. Huh. Okay, this looks like a word that's probably going to come up a few times, so we might want to figure out what that is. There's also a, an insert. Maybe it will tell some of the things for us. McClellan's bayonet exercise. <clears throat> this order included one McClellan's bayonet exercise. Number one. No. Sorry. That was... One... McClellan's Bayonet Exercise for a dollar twenty-five. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> We're gonna have to search. Oh, uh, let's see. In the District Court of the United States for the Eastern District of Virginia in bankruptcy, blank of blank of blank and state of blank creditor of uh, Mary P. Hobson, <clears throat> which mm, un, uncertain, uh, bankrupt. Sir, you are hereby notified that a warrant in bankruptcy has just been issued out of the District Court of the United States for the Eastern District of Virginia against the estate of Mary P. Hobson of Goochland County, adjusted, uh, adjudged a bankrupt upon her own petition that the payment of any debts and the delivery of any property belonging to said bankrupt to her or for her use and the transfer of any property by her are forbidden by law, that a meeting of the creditors of said bankrupt to wit... Interesting that bankrupt is used as a, a descriptor, as an adjective for, like, to, taking the place of the person. Uh, all right, so I assume Mead and Baker should be on there somewhere, but I don't see. Oh, there it is. Uh, she owed $27 to Mead and Baker to prove their debts and choose one or more assignees of said estate will be held at court of bankruptcy. Hmm. Interesting.
that is inserted in here. But what, okay, so what then, what is that? I am curious. Um, I'm going to start with the Serpentaria, which is a kind of flowering plant. Snake root. Endodisa. Aristolochia. Hmm. I don't know. I'm going to try and learn. So the, the script in the book... One half R A D it looks like I and C possibly, but I do not know. Hmm. That's Aristolochia. Which is called Virginia Snake Root. It's entirely possible that that's it. I just don't know what this abbreviation is then. But I'm not going to spend forever on it. Um, and I will probably never find it. Uh, so let's just go back. Okay, so the Serpentaria thing, uh, some sort of plant. Um, medicinal plant. Let's see. And then... What? Because that definitely looks like it ends with like a pi, capital B, lowercase o, capital T. Which makes zero sense to me. And this one is just tannin. Liquor, potass. What does that mean? What does it mean? <laughs> I'm so confused. Um, okay, now I'm going to I'm going to try. I have no idea if I'm going to find anything.
let's see. I'm I'm going. I searched for uh, 1860 apothecary abbreviations. Um, let's see if this provides any guidance. This is a Wikipedia article here. The apothecary's system, or apothecary's weights and measures, is a historical system of mass and volume units that were used by physicians and apothecaries for medical prescriptions, and also sometimes by scientists. The English version of the system is closely related to the English Troy system of weights, the pound, and grain. Doesn't seem to help here. Being exactly the same in both, divides into 12 ounces, an ounce into eight uh, drachms, and a drachm into three scruples. Of 20 grains each. Is that form of the system? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, survived well into the 20th century. For a long time, medical recipes were written in Latin, often using special symbols to denote weights and measures. <clears throat> All right. You kind of know what the Troy system is? Still used to weigh precious metals. Hi, Sterling. You just see a portion of the show. Oh, I... Did you have, like, um... Midterms? Isn't it midterm time? Uh, pound. Pounds. Drachm. Or dram. Oh, dram. I didn't know that's... Okay. Scruple. Grain. I, that none of those help though, because this is like something bot. But what is that? I may have just figured it out. Ounce, pint, dram, minim. 1809. That's too early. What 18? All right. Glass tumblers. Breakfast cup. <laughs> what? Teacup. Wine glass. Tablespoon. Tumbler full. Wine glass full. Dessert spoonful. Okay. 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 Dandelion infusion, extract, sodium. Test. Okay. Interesting. R H E I. I that's definitely not what we had before, but Okay. So confusing. You're on breaking class right now? <laughs> My beard is longer than yours. Oh dear. But do you still have the mustache? That's that's the question. Right. I'm uncertain whether that article is in any way helpful. This definitely just looks like it definitely looks like a capital B. Lowercase o, capital T. But in front of the B, there's like a... Two. Elixir bark. Two. Bot? I don't know what it is. You shaved that as soon as the conference was over? Amazing. Oh my gosh. Noir Enigma. Hello. Welcome in Noir. Uh, welcome in Raiders. Uh, it is it is good to have you joining. I am uh, Rogan27, aka Anthony Wright de Hernandez. I'm Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. And this is Archival Adventures, where I share materials from the archives uh, once a week. And uh, today we are looking at an apothecary ledger from uh, Mead and Baker, who were uh, one of the largest apothecaries in um, in Virginia in the 1860s. Uh, they were based in Richmond. 
and um, <laughs> we have barely touched the surface of the book, but uh, we're already thoroughly confused. So welcome in, everybody. If anybody knows anything about um, apothecaries, historical medicine, or honestly is is able to read this writing better than me, uh, you're welcome to weigh in in chat. Also, hi to Lovely. Um, and uh, yeah, if anybody here is not following Noir, you should be following Noir. Um, Noir is a wonderful, wonderful streamer. Uh, with Noir is very active in TTRPGs, um, has been part of the stream punks for a little while, uh, and uh, has been revisiting some um, older TTRPG content in the mornings. Uh, don't spoil whether Caitlin is actually in Callisto 6 or not. Noir has to discover that on his own. <laughs> Wait, I know these humans. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, so I'm, I'm, I, I thought for a minute that maybe this was Fox, but it's not. I have no idea what Fox is. Okay, I'm going to move on. We've been analyzing, and we're just going to see what we can find that makes sense. Um, all right, so this is Mason and Johnson. Hmm, okay. Uh... Bottles! It's bottles! Finally! Something where it made sense! <laughs> okay, so... I still... Because of... It's partly because of the, um extra notation on there, uh, which is just noting that it was paid. Um, th this first entry, I'm, I'm not sure, certain what it is. Half something of Serpentaria. Um, but I can't really make out what that so is. Why are you doing that again? Sorry. Quetzal, despite being told no lyrics, has tracks with words. Uh, anyway, uh, four. I still can't quite make that out. But that it's it's whatever that is, and potassium bottles. This is um, one uh, tannin bottle. So, okay. This is Liquor, potassium, bottle. Yeah. Still not completely comprehensible yet. But, uh, like, we have a half an unguent. Cantharides? C-A-N-T-H-A-R-I-D-E-S. Um, there are so many terms that I do not know what they are. Uh, but that's why this is all about learning. Pantherides is Spanish fly? And so what is this? Unguent of Spanish fly. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Sure. This... So, uh, Pantherides is... Spanish fly. This species and others in its family were used in traditional apothecary preparations as cantharides. The insect is the source of the terpenoid cantharidin, a toxic blistering agent once used as an exfoliating agent, anti-rheumatic drug, and an aphrodisiac. Uh, can also be found in culinary use in some blends in the North African spice mix Raz and El, Raz El Hanout. Its various supposed benefits have been responsible for accidental poisonings. Uh, it, have a good time, class, Sterling. Thanks for stopping by. Yes, this stream is not for actual medical advice. Please do not take it as such. If you're having physical or mental issues, please seek professional help as soon as possible. Um, yeah, so... Half... A half measure of... Uh, like, I'm not certain what measure it is. I can't really tell um, what this tiny little symbol here is meaning as far as measurement, but um, unguent of cantharides. So uh, the Spanish fly is prepared in some way in which it is part of like a greasy ointment. <laughs> Two bottles of elixir bark. What is elixir bark? I do not know, but it was $1.75 for two bottles. I still want to know, what is this one McClellan's Bayonet exercise for Was it a book? I see one of the first results is a manual of bayonet exercise. Elixir bark, does it give you bark skin? I d not that I know of. Uh, oh yeah. Okay, so McClellan's bayonet exercise manual was an attempt to provide the basic rudiments of how the bayonet could be used in both offense and defense. Thank you to Civil War reenactors for having that information. I found it on a... So it was based on a French army fencing manual. Interesting. Uh, I located this information on the website of the the Buff Sticks Company K Third U.S. Regular Infantry Reenactors, um, and apparently they have a PDF copy of the manual if you happen to want to see it. Um, so that was a dollar twenty-five for that manual, apparently. Okay, I'm gonna let's move ahead to another page <laughs> because we have spent forever on that first page um honestly uh let's see february 5th 1861 to july 5th 1861. Julian Harrison, something something Taylor. Elk Hill. Four ounce jar. Nope. Because that's a T, not a J. Four ounce 
PR period. L E A T E and file. <clears throat> I do not know. One. Okay, there's a breast pump on there for $1.75. One truss for rifles, I can't make out all of these words, but mostly because some of them just, I am confused at encountering them. Um, P-R-L-E-A-T. Leet. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This time, typing in an approximation of what I could parse out of the letters did not find a result for me. So I'm uncertain what that first item is. Uh, maybe as we learn the handwriting, it will become more clear. Uh, Jason D. Isbell. Um, I'm just unsure of the location, but Cumberland, um, by two six dollars and fifty cents by two starts with a T. Tanser? I'm not sure. You're all welcome to weigh in if these letters uh, make sense to you. Hi, Stephen Joyce. So far, I am failing at reading this 1860s handwriting. Um, oh, I can make out this one at least. Sent to starts with an E. I can't make out the first name. Uh, last name is Parker Percy by M A N. Yeah, I'm Nani or Nanny or something like that. Uh, all right, so we have Dr. Jonathan B. Fontaine uh, in Hanover County. And we've got... Uh, some hair tonic for 50 cents. Twelve, one gall blind. Three, 
for 75 cents. FL. Don't know what other letters that would be. But I'm only familiar with that word as a creature from Dungeons and Dragons. Which is definitely not what is being referenced here. <laughs> uh. One. Ah. It's funny typing in um, words from an 1860s apothecary ledger into an internet search engine and seeing what it tries to make them become. old handwriting the real puzzle yeah no it, it it very definitely is like if i could be certain of the letters that i was seeing i would probably be able to figure out uh what this says 12 one gall it's not an no it is an f that's definitely an f because right above it is a capital t in the word tonic and this is identical to the T, except that it has the little F that goes across in the center and down, which is an F. Fluid. Fluid. It's fluid. Thank you. A 12, one gall fluid. Four sixths, 75 cents. No idea what that is. Um, does anybody speak apothecary? <laughs> Gall fluid. I don't know. Some sort of herbal tincture, tincture blend for treating the gallbladder, I'm assuming. <laughs> Someone should gamify transcribing old handwriting documents. That would be amazing. Um, it is interesting, especially, like, it's exciting when you're able to start to make out something. Uh, one, repairing S, C, A, N. Uh, R. T-O-R. I, I know it's written in English. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, definitely repairing. It could be so I'm uncertain whether that's an F or um, the long S. But either way, I can't figure out what that word, what that second word is. One pen knife for $1.25. That one's easy. I can make that one out. 
uh, one sheet of some kind of paper. S E S E T N. Yeah, I, I'm uncertain what adjective they're using on the paper, but 15 cents for that sheet of paper. And one sheet of another kind of paper for 15 cents as well. I, 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 yeah, moving on. Uh, let's see, Messrs. Uh, P.J. Waring and Dr. Waring. A-L-E-T-T-S -E -E -T -T in King William. Two bottles, prescription E-18, 115 renewed. For a dollar fifty. One ounce of powdered turkey rhubarb for seventy five cents. Uh, let's see, one quarter. Whatever that measure is, I'm not certain what measure that is. Uh, sub knit bismuth, seventy five cents. The one that catches my eye here is the powdered turkey rhubarb. Hi, Iron Trout. <clears throat> oh my gosh. I've never heard of turkey rhubarb. It's a plant. I, I mean, rhubarb is a plant, but there's a... I didn't know that there was a thing called turkey rhubarb. This is where the learning comes in. <laughs> Rium palmatum. Commonly called Chinese rhubarb, ornamental rhubarb, turkey rhubarb, or East Indian rhubarb. Amazing. Folk medicine. So this is where it would come into apothecary use. <clears throat> Used as herbal medicine. Uh, dried roots become one of the most prominent items traded along the Silk Road. Imported roots of various rhubarb species were widely used in Europe for hundreds of years before the identity of the plant was eventually discovered. Some of the common names, yeah. Known for its purported purging effects and suppressing fever. In ancient China, rhubarb root was taken to try to cure stomach ailments as and as a cathartic, an agent used to relieve constipation. Used as a poultice for fevers and edema. Uh, given its Latin name by Carolus Linnaeus in 1759. First grown in Britain around 1762. Mm. Interesting. Also, apparently pregnant women should avoid it, but also do not take medical advice from this stream. <laughs> Since its roots and rhizome, which serve as the source of medic medicinal usage, uh, special care is taken in their preparation. Six to ten years old, the rhizomes of the plants are removed from the ground in the autumn when both its stems and leaves changed to yellow wild. Furthermore, the removal of the lateral rootlets and the crown are removed. Any debris around the root is cleaned off. The coarse exterior bark removed. The root cut and divided into cube-like pieces to increase. Wow. Interesting. I was unfamiliar with this specific herb. 
actually, let's see. Okay, so we're here in in 1861. Uh, let's see, we got some creosote, syrup, Seneca. Now we're just pinning the command. Yes. <laughs> you forgot you could pin it. Now medical is just there. Yeah. Syrup Senega. Senega? I think that second letter there, the sorry, fourth letter in the word is an I. Or not. No, it's an E. And there's a WebMD article. Seneca is a plant. The root is used to make medicine. Used for decline in memory and thinking skills that occurs normally with age, asthma, swelling of the throat, nose, and chest, and many other conditions. But there's no good scientific evidence to support these uses. The chemicals in Seneca irritate the lining of the stomach and lungs. Some chemicals in Seneca protect cells in the brain. <laughs> Insufficient evidence. Possibly safe, but when taken by mouth for up to eight weeks. Possibly unsafe for more than eight weeks. <laughs> May cause stomach irritation, diarrhea, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting. Interesting. There are more warnings. <clears throat> it's just surprising that, like, it has uh, an actual article on WebMD. Which, apparently, I can't just get back out of. But when, whatever. So it's, it's another um, route that is prepared. So this has been <clears throat> put into bottles. Uh, aerated. Bark. Unsure. Two bottles of tannin. Uh... Balsam John? I'm, I'm fairly certain that's what that says. Balsam John? Which does not uh, yield useful results when searching. Um, let's see. That would take some concerted effort to dig through all of the useless results in an internet search. Um, <clears throat> two cans blistering tissue for $2.50. Why do I want to buy blistering tissue? Um, I'm uncertain about that one. Uh, eight ounces gum myrrh for 38 cents. A six ounce bottle of glycerin for $1.25. Uh, eight 
ounces of nitric acid, eight ounces of iodine potash, Let's see. Bromide something. I don't know what this D O. But then we also have acetate with the same second word, and I'm not certain what that is. One uh, gallon of alcohol and fluid. For a dollar thirteen. Uh, eight ounces of hive syrup. An eight ounce bottle of hive syrup for forty four cents. Uh, an eight ounce bottle of syrup. Sile. S C I L L A E. 44 cents. Hmm. Some of these I kind of get, and some of a lot of them I'm like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> Let's jump ahead a little bit. And see. 1861. Let's go. Further into 1861, towards harder to read handwriting. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a ledger from a shop, so at some point, the person writing in this ledger uh, changed to a different person, apparently, because the handwriting changes completely. Which makes sense. This ledger covers an entire decade. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, this handwriting is harder to read. So as as poorly as I was doing, oh boy. Uh, Richmond, April 26, 1861. Dr. Jason L. Wills. Uh, I can't make out what the city name is. One pocket case for $19.60. And one mushroom pipe for $4. I don't think that says mushroom. Or pipe. Okay, let's see. What, what does this actually say? <laughs> M U N S C H A M M Munchum Oh gosh we have more whimsies coming or well we had ox crew before now we have we have whimsies actually I don't know what Noir's community is called on Noir's channel but 16 bit Eric hello welcome in raiders uh, it is good to see all of you. Um, I am Rogan27, aka Anthony Wright Day Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and uh, this is Archival, Ad Archival Adventures, um, uh, a Wednesday show that I do to look at things from special collections and university archives, and um, uh, we see what we can figure out. Um, often I've never looked at them before. Uh, sometimes I have trouble reading them, um, as in today. Uh, today we're looking at an 1860s apothecary ledger from one of the largest apothecaries in uh, Richmond. Uh, it covers the whole decade of the 1860s. Um, so including the entirety of the American Civil War and Richmond being the um, capital of the Confederate States of America. Uh, at some point, we'll actually get to content from during the war, I assume. But um, we've been spending a lot of time trying to decipher handwriting. And when we can decipher it, trying to figure out 
what the products are because this one's easy a pocket case for 1960. this is munchum it looks like p e long s But I haven't figured it out yet. Four dollars. I initially read it as mushroom pipe. It is not mushroom pipe. <laughs> Although mushroom pipe would make it so much easier to read. Anyway, welcome in everybody. It's great to have you joining. Uh, how was the stream, Eric? How was the game? Did you play a game? I think you played a game. Um... Ah. ah! Uh, random misspellings on internet search engines have proved successful. It is indeed a long S. Uh, it is a munchum pest, P-E-S-T-E, for the modern spelling. which I don't know what it's used for. Wait, no, maybe not. Maybe I have been failed. <laughs> nope. Yeah, no, I don't know. No idea. It's definitely M U N S C H A M M. Hi, Blue Rooster. Which gets me Zippo. So that one is another mystery because I have absolutely no idea. Four dollars for whatever it was. Uh <laughs> one G L. One glycerol of scad. <laughs> the pinned message. This stream is not for actual medical advice. That is very, very much so. Especially because we can't even figure out what these words are. Of scan. Glycerol of scat. Has actual results, although... They are way above my level of medical education. <laughs> uh, so... Like, the top results are bringing back things like lipid metabolism and cancer. Human enzymes. So, uncertain. It's, it's, like, it's, most of the time it's not, like, the apothecary products are not 
equivalent to what we would call um, medicine today quite often, but sometimes there's an interesting overlap. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so this one, this sale here, um, one plug of tobacco for 25 cents. I can't figure out what the $1 item below it was, though. Oh, here's a fun one. To, uh, on May the 2nd, 1861, to E.G. Lee in Powhatan, Virginia, two ounce vial of laudanum for 31 cents. Oh, to have tobacco, yeah, definitely known for being extremely healthy. I mean, it's 1861. <laughs> uh, two boxes of Holloway's Worm Confections. Yum. I mean, it's medicine, but uh, does that say 30 cents? 50 cents. 50 cents. Holloway's Worm Confections. I wonder if if it will have any results at all. Holloway's worm confections. <gasps> I found a reference. Uh, that mentions it. Cover lists the products being handled by the company. It just lists it. It doesn't say what it is or give a picture. Hi, Baba Yeeha. I'm very kind of frightened by the idea of worm confections. I do not know. They were, um, I, I, I'll bring this up on screen so you can see it, but, uh, the, the reference that I found online to, for Holloway's Worm Confections is this postcard, uh, from Johnston, Holloway, and Cowden, located in Philadelphia. Looks like this was uh, postmarked 1862. Um, they were wholesale patent medicine dealers because patent medicine is so reliable. Um, <clears throat> proprietors of Holloway's Worm Confections, Holloway's Cathartic Sugar Drops, Holloway's Arnica Plasters, Holloway's uh, Avnia Liniment, Holloway's Essence of Jamalia Ginger and Heskel's Tetter Ointment. <laughs> Wait, what the? Oh, one brick in the wall. Thank you so much for the follow. Um, you arrived when I said worm confections and you're curious. <laughs> It could be related to Wormwood. It could also be just a product that they um, claimed would help with, like, stomach worms or stuff like that. Uh, let's see. Manufacturers of vent plasters, hemlock pitch plasters, burgundy pitch plasters, uh... Offsonal warming plasters, agents of Sines's syrup of tar, wild cherry, and whorebound uh, Sines dysentery compound. Uncertain, but 
Um, that was the best result that I found. I mean, there's this, but I don't think this actually, it's the same site. Plasters. Yeah, that's the plasters. Uh, plasters in this case would be like a band-aid. But I don't know otherwise, like anything more about this worm confections. View the bottles of there's a there's a reference on here to worm confections. Come on, University of New Brunswick. <laughs> This, this seems promising. <clears throat> Advertisement from a Lyman Sons and Company uh, price current circa 1906 to 1909. Example, yeah, 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 whatever. Uh, <laughs> here's the typesetting. Spelling of a uh, electric oil and the number of G's in Kellogg's, for example. Holloway's corn cure is an intriguing item. Thomas Holloway, an English tradesman who first marketed his ointment in 1838 and his pills soon after secured widespread distribution for his goods, which included Holloway's worm confections and Holloway's expectorant around 1868. However, there is no evidence at this point that Holloway made a corn cure. Neither Holcomb nor the British Medical Association name it with his other products. I had hoped that we would get some more specific uh, worm confections content, but I'm assuming that the worm confections are similar to Graves' worm exterminator that's showing up here. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. If anybody does run across anything, please share. Um, let's see, a dozen bottle corks for 13 cents. Half pound of Paris tobacco for 50 cents. And it was all delivered to EGL. Total of $1.44. Laudanum. Worm confections, bottle corks, and tobacco. Super healthy order, that one. Let's see. I'm going to jump into 1862. Let's just see as we progress. Ooh. Let's see. Oh, God. Uh, an entry page here from Richmond on November 18th, 1862. Um, Jonathan. J. Hardaway. A return customer somebody that we we had look, looking at these prices it makes you wonder how much stuff the bankrupt lady actually ordered yeah because her total amount that she owed was 27 dollars maybe worm confections just means the worms will find them tasty then eat them and die in worm extermination i like this idea one brick in the wall that that seems entirely plausible. Uh, we have a four ounce tinct tincture of iodine for $2.25. Uh, 
Um, another one for Jonathan Hardaway. Uh, one bottle of black paint for hearths for two dollars and fifty cents, and one bunch one no idea really no idea bunch for do it doesn't make any sense to me anyway <laughs> uh Apparently they sold paint. I suppose that makes sense. Somebody would have to mix the paint and they would have the various materials to mix it together, I guess. Uh, syrup iodine iron. Or iodine. Iodied iron. It was an expensive one. It's been, let's see, bottled. I don't know what this measure is. Epsom salts. Turpentine. Uh. Morphine. <laughs> you missed a lot of work talk? Worm talk. Yes. Yes. Uh, Elixie, do you know anything about Holloway's worm confections? We, we saw them listed in one of these um, orders, but I wasn't able to find a lot about what they were. Oh, here's a great one. Uh, Dr. Randolph Harrison... Uh, per Sadie in Elk Hill, two ounces of Quicksilver for a dollar fifty, and indeed, in the eighteen sixties, this being what eighteen sixty three, Quicksilver would have been ingested as a medicine. Quicksilver being mercury, and once it's in your body, you don't get it out again, and it will slowly make you go insane and kill you through heavy metal poisoning. <laughs> yeah, it was a patent medicine of some sort. That's, yeah, that's all I could figure out, too. <laughs> okay. Um... Kent Payne and Company to be sold on our something. 18 boxes. Charles Sr. Fort Ocean something. Chewing tobacco. This, this is a bulk order of chewing tobacco here in 1863. I do not understand what all of the notations mean, but the total price for all of this chewing tobacco, four 
thousand three hundred twenty-two dollars and three cents in eighteen sixty-three. Most definitely the most expensive order we have seen. And it looks like, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. I don't, I, I don't know what is quantity, what is a notation of the type, etc. But it looks like in total they ordered one thousand eight hundred and forty-nine units at two dollars and fifty cents each, um, totaling four thousand six hundred and twenty-two dollars and fifty cents, and then. Uh, there were some sort of uh, service charge for three hundred dollars and forty-seven cents. <laughs> we needed historical terms for ancient medical advice. Oh, uh, Blue Rooster, it's pinned. <laughs> it appears to have been a patent medicine to cure worms that several uh, producers made in candy form. You. You can also see it called Holloway's Vermifuge Confections. I love Vermifuge. That's a great word. Four thousand. That's spendy. All right, let's. See. Also, things are getting more expensive because we've. We've moved into the war period here. Uh, oh, we got some new handwriting. I think probably similar Blue Rooster to the like worm medication given to dogs and cats, but this was meant for humans for sure. Which was why it was turned into confections. Uh, just meaning they basically, it would have been like a cough drop of some sort. Like some sort of, uh, that sort of delivery system for the medication. Uh... We got the contharities again. Oh, um, <clears throat> one half ounce. This is a different preparation. Before it was an unguent. I'm uncertain what this abbreviation is meaning, but it's the cantharides, so the Spanish fly. Uh. Quinine sulfur? Is that a thing? 100 something Q U I N Quinine is the only word I can come up with that that could be quinine sulfate used to treat malaria and some types of leg cramps. That makes sense. I can't read the measurement. I'm uncertain what measurement that is, but that's fine. Four ounces. Uh, No idea. I can read carbon ammonia on the next one down. Uh, sulfur morphia, morphine. Spelled sulfate, but you're on mobile. 
<laughs> no, you got it. Oh, uh, well, with the F. The F is the modern spelling. Sulfur morphia, that would be morphine. Syrup psyllae. Um, we ran across that one before, but I didn't look it up. Psyllae. Uh, uh, it wants to give me Scylla without the E. Which I'm guessing is... <laughs> Wait, what? Um... Yeah, this is going to be the same thing, I think. So there's a plant, and we've seen other plant-based syrup preparations. Um, this is basically hyacinth. But, uh, who here, well, I hardly need to ask with this audience, but, um, who here's a fan of Star Trek? Because this item, this um, four ounce vial of syrup psyllae for $4.25, is a product, essentially, that is mentioned on Deep Space Nine. Because uh, the psyllae are sometimes called squills. And uh, so on Deep Space Nine, there is an entire B-plot involving Quark and Syrup of Squill. <laughs> I wonder if that's just a coincidence? <laughs> That's a deep cut, you don't remember it. I uh I do, but I also know. Um oh, which one is it? Yeah, it like it was a sweet red hued liquid, properly uh, popularly used on breakfast foods, so not uh, the same, I presume. Uh, but yeah, it was in uh, the episode The Magnificent Ferengi. So uh, that would have been season seven, right? That's the one where Quark has to rescue his mother from the Dominion. Oh, uh, season six. <laughs> Your brain went to Scylla from the Odyssey? Fair. I mean, I wasn't thinking Syrup of Squill until I realized that um, the plant, the, the Scylla plant that this syrup is made of is called Squills, sometimes in English. So this would be uh, Syrup Scylla would be Syrup of Squill. which was a product that Quark was trying to uh, uh, corner the market on. 
in in Deep Space Nine season six. From the 1860s to the 25th century, 24th century, 24th century. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. 1860. I wanted to find some 1865. There's actually not a lot of entries from during the American Civil War. Um, because this was all, uh, like the mail order orders. So I guess that makes sense. Is it just me, or every change of handwriting is just as hard to read? Uh, Richmond, November 22nd, 1865. Dr. A.L. Brent. <clears throat> I am uncertain what this location uh, is. Anyway. Uh... One ounce aromatic spirits of ammonia. Ah, I finally got an abbreviation that I saw and was able to figure out. Aromatic spirits of ammonia. Uh, two ounces of simple cerate. Uh, let's see, delivered to Dr. L L Lake, L L E K E. Okay, uh, and then we have an order, December eleventh. Four ounces. Calm. Oh, sorry, that's C C Coke. They look like L's to me. Pump of. I'm not even going to try because they wrote over their own writing, but uh, sarsaparilla, spelled sarsaparilla here. That was the only reason I was reading this one, because I saw the word sarsaparilla. <clears throat> uh, let's see. One jar of Baldi's Dentine. Caldi's? Calder's Dentine? Something like that. C-O-M-P-D compound. That would make sense. Compound of E-X-T Sarsaparilla U-S-P. So many of these things that that sounds dangerous. Yeah. But sarsaparilla should be fine. I don't know what Calder's dentine is, but it's probably like a tooth powder, would be my guess. But it's a named product, so it's also possible that I might be able to look it up, which is always kind of fun. Oh, yeah. Indeed, indeed. And and it was a tooth powder. Um, the Smithsonian has an image that we can look at. Calder's Saponasis. I almost said it. Oh, USP, US Pharmacopoeia. That might make sense, Lord, Port Lord Portico. Uh, Calder's Saponaceous Dentine. Um... For cleansing, preserving, and beautifying. He was a pharmacist in Providence. First marketed the product in 1867. Interesting. According to this 
description from the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian, it says, brought this product to market in 1867. This sales receipt in the ledger says that they sold Calder's Dentine in 1865. So this might not be the exact product uh, because this is um, saponaceous dentine. So maybe the saponaceous dentine and the, the just dentine were different products. Um, but, oh, they've got, it looks like a Wells Fargo wagon at the bottom here. Interesting. Ooh, ooh, it's got writing on the back, and I think we'll be able to read it. Calder's Saponaceous Dentine. You found another reference that it was sold as early as 1850? Well, I know for sure, 1865, it was available. So, uh, Calder's Saponaceous Dentine is an exceptionally pure and effic efficacious uh Dentit I can't even say this word. Uh, dentist rice. It renders the teeth white and smooth, the gums healthy, firm, and red, and by frequent use preserves them in this condition. It effectually removes tartar and destroys the parasitical animi animalcule animalculae, which neglect permits to collect and prevents their further accumulation, gingivitis, uh, thus serving as a complete beautifier and preserver of the teeth. Those parasitical animalculae, I can't say it, animalculae, uh, parasitical animalculae, uh, that's essentially, they didn't know about bacteria. This is too early for kind of that level of understanding. But essentially, they're talking about gingivitis there. Tartar and gingivitis. The gum's healthy, smooth, and red. <laughs> yeah, uh, red tends to be inflamed, but... Interesting. Interesting. And tooth powder is the precursor to toothpaste. Toothpaste is just tooth powder that has uh, been turned into a gel form and is has water or moisture already in it. Tooth powder, you had to mix with water to form a paste to clean your teeth. I'm going to jump toward, towards the end of the decade because we are at time. Um, let's see what this order for Jonathan B. McPhail was all about. People used to use baking powder. Um, I don't know. Elixir, do you know? I know baking soda-based toothpastes are a thing. Uh, I mean, like, the brand Arm & Hammer... Arm & Hammer that makes baking soda makes baking soda toothpaste. So I assume baking soda just by itself uh, used to be used. But I've never specifically gone and looked. But I assume so because there is a modern product that uses baking soda for toothpaste. Jonathan B. McPhail. April 3rd, 1869. Half again the measurement, but in this in this case it's even harder because the measurement was used on the line above for the thing that was crossed out, uh, which appears to be a bottle of some kind of potash. 
but I don't know what the measurement is. Anyway, so half of the same measure of whiting uh, for 10 cents. And from pages 482, what? That's not an A. So what is that? I don't know. They ordered something from page 482. So there must have been a catalog at this point uh, for $1.50. One ounce bromide potash for 50 cents. And then on July 13th, half an ounce of... L-E-R-I-N-T? Or L-E-N-I-N-T. I'm uncertain. 15 cents, whatever it is. Le Lenint? Lerint? I don't know what that is. I could poke around and find it, but... Uh, well, possibly. But we've been doing that the whole stream. I'm going to move on. A dozen boxes of... Blunnings? B L U N I B L Bluings? B L U I N G S? It's hard to know because the the U There's definitely a U and an I. And it appears to have like a lowercase N. And actually the the way the handwriting is, it's not just a series of up and downs. So it's U, I, N, and the, the dot is over the N instead of over the I. Um, but yeah, a, half a dozen boxes of bluings. <laughs> that seems like it's probably another like brand name product. <clears throat> Or not, or yes, but also not what I thought. Because uh, I almost had the spelling right. It's Blueen. The great bleaching, bluing, and purifier. It will not settle, it will not streak, nor injure the clothes. So bluing, um, bluing would be a specific product of bluing, a, a specific type of bluing, apparently. Um, but yeah, it appears to be like laundry bleach. What is bluing? Instructions on how to do laundry. Inevitably, you'll come upon the rinsing of clothes to be done by putting into bluing. This was what was commonly used to brighten whites. In its earliest forms, it was used by having indigo tied in a thin muslin bag and shaken in the water until the right shade was produced to brighten whites. The natural indigo was of a darker blue color and dull, according to some. In addition, it was costly to manufacture. So when other cheaper and brighter blues were made, the indigo bluing fell out of general use. But why, why blue to make whites whiter? I am confused. <gasps> it 
these blue dye with acid. The acid dissolves the blue and holds it evenly in the water so that specking will never take place. I have never, I had, I, this is something that I was unfamiliar with. I, I am, I am learning about bluing. So whatever they needed a half a dozen boxes of bluings. I know when I bleached my hair, purple would take the brassiness out. If there was more orange, I would use blue. Huh. Yeah. I just don't understand how it works, that's all. Apparently it is, it's basically used for whitening whites, but, and it's still used today. Oh, thank you. Modern. Modern, uh, somebody talking about modern usage gives me the information that I needed. Bluing products improve the brightness of white fabrics by adding a blue pigment that counteracts the natural yellowing that occurs during regular laundering. Which makes sense, but I it it didn't I didn't understand. Oh, hang on, I'll zoom in. Uh, this is from a website called The Spruce, apparently. Um, but yeah, they have an actual definition. In laundry bluing, a product adds a trace amount of blue dye to white fabric uh, to improve its appearance. But they actually explain above that. Thank you. Thank you, the Spruce, for explaining how it works, because I could not understand. Improve the brightness of white fabrics by adding a blue pigment, pigment that counteracts the natural yellowing that occurs during regular laundering. So it's OxyClean, kind of, come in both powdered and liquid forms. The eye perceives the nearly undetectable amount of blue and sees the fabric as whiter. Commercial bluing products are highly concentrated and must be diluted before use to prevent permanent staining and streaking. Liquid bluing is a colloidal suspension of a very fine blue iron powder and water. Other ingredients include a pH balancer and a biocide to prevent the buildup of algae and bacteria. They're talking about the modern ones, but... Um, Yeah, there are modern products. I have never heard of this before. Fascinating. You can use it to darken jeans. That makes more sense to me than whitening whites. But hey, the things you learn about by looking through a Civil War era apothecary ledger. I've learned about plants I didn't know existed. I have learned about laundry processes I didn't know existed. I, I don't know. I always learn something on this show. It changes iron into uh, Fe304 as aluminum and polymer polymers do not rust. Maybe, so maybe something to do with Hard. Yeah, possibly something to do with hard water. I think it was fascinating. Um, yeah, so it's an amazing ledger. Um, 
as noted in the, the finding aid, when we looked at that at the beginning of stream, uh, if you spend the time to go through that ledger and um, look at the prices, identify like similar products at the beginning of the ledger versus the end of the ledger, uh, you can see how bad inflation was uh, in the Confederacy during the American Civil War. Uh, the, the notation in the finding aid uh, by John, uh, one of our employees here who, who wrote the finding aid, was that um, in 1861, the price of a toothbrush, uh, hang on, I'm going to find it because I will quote it wrong otherwise. Uh, in February of 1861, there's a price recorded for a toothbrush for 25 cents. And then in January of 1865, the same toothbrush was $12. <laughs> oh my gosh. Another, another raid. Hi, newbie muffin. Welcome in. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the follow, Luke XY and, um, Young Druid 88 and, and Mutter Toad? Uh, oh dear. The bot did not like um, all of the emotes, apparently. But uh, welcome in. How are you? What? Uh, how was your stream? I hope it was good. Um, I, am, I am Rogan27, or also known as uh, Anthony Wright J. Hernandez. I'm the Community Collections Archivist at Virginia Tech. And this show that you're coming in uh, uh, 25 cents to $12, one brick in the wall, over the course of the American Civil War. Uh, this is, it's called Archival Adventures, and I share things from special collections and university archives here at Virginia Tech. Uh, today we were looking at um, an apothecary ledger from one of the largest apothecaries in the state of Virginia uh, during the American Civil War era. And the ledger started in 1861 and goes through 1870, I believe. Um, so it uh, spans the entire decade. Um, it was a mail order ledger, um, but has orders from during uh, the American Civil War when Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. Um, and yeah, we saw, we spent a lot of time trying to read the handwriting. It's really hard to read. Um, but uh, yeah, we were just, we were actually just sort of winding down to, to end because I have to um, start packing up to head home. But um, I, I'm very happy that you joined us. Uh, the ledger itself lives here in, in the archives. I don't see a notation that it's been digitized, but if anybody um, wants to learn more about it, you can uh, check out the finding aid that is in the link there. Um, and you can always get in touch with us at... Um... Do I not have the contact info sitting here? You can get in touch with us at uh, specref at vt.edu um, if you, you want to ask us any reference questions or anything like that. Um, but yeah, next week... What is next week? I've forgotten what next week is. I'm opening up my, my schedule to see... Oh! Uh... Next week, I have fire boss reports from anthracite coal mining in West Virginia. I've got, I don't remember exactly how many, but they're um, basically the safety reports <laughs> uh, from people who would go around the mine to check to make sure that there wasn't a buildup of gas, uh, et cetera, to make sure that things weren't going to light on fire because coal mining leads to lots of flammable gases. Uh, and I saw them. They seem kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure we can spend two hours 
looking through them and learning about uh, what what it was like to inspect a coal mine for safety. Uh, I don't remember the exact time period, but it's somewhere at least early 19th century or early 20th century. I don't I don't remember for sure. Uh, Henny 40, thank you for the follow. Um, so yeah, that's coming up next week. <laughs> yeah, uh, ageism is is definitely a term. So, but yeah, basically, young and old are all welcome here. Um, so yeah, next week, coal mining uh, reports. And then the week after that, I have another one of the um, speculative fiction stories that Sam Moskowitz identified as classics in 1940. Um, and then uh, Evaporated Milk Association, National Biscuit Company. Uh, you know, we got some more things coming up. Um, but yeah, every Wednesday, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, I am here uh, looking at something from the archives. Uh, and seeing what we can learn. So um, I hope that you all will join again in the future. Let me see where we're going to raid to, though. Uh, I'm not sure who is live. Um, there is, of course, Stephen. Right. Oh! It is National Fossil Day, apparently. So uh, we're going to pop in on another educational streamer and head over to Paleontologizing uh, for National Fossil Day. Hopefully you will all find that um, educational, interesting. Paleontologizing is, is a really good streamer, and I think you should have a good time. Um, so let me set that up here. And we will head there in just a moment. Having two channels to manage everything on just makes it a little bit more complicated. Um, anyway, thank you all so much for joining me today. I hope that uh, I will see you all again uh, for an upcoming stream soon. Uh, and until I do, keep exploring history, everybody. I know I find it fascinating, and I hope that you do too.